Becca is a registered dietitian with 13 years of experience in helping patients heal from within through nutrition. Her philosophy has always been focused on taking a holistic approach to understanding the needs of patients. She works closely with the UCLA Kidney Corps and Dr. Rostogi, who's on our medical advisory committee, helping educate chronic kidney disease patients on nutritional needs at all stages of disease. Ms. Goodrich received her bachelor's degree in human sciences from Florida State University, a master's degree in nutrition and dietetics from Florida International University, and certification as a registered dietitian through the Commission on Diabetic Registration. Uh, Ms. Goodrich works directly with patients through her company in Los Angeles, Rad Nutrition. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you all so much for having me here today. I'm really excited. I love talking about kidneys and um, <laughs> I love talking about uh, just the prevention standpoint, using nutrition to, to help with kidney disease. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Oh, we're really glad you're here. And this yeah. is a really big topic for our community um, at all stages of, of chronic kidney disease, including Alport syndrome. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of things we struggle with, um, with diet. And so I'm glad you're here to answer questions. I know you've put a presentation with uh, uh, for us together today. It's only about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll get into questions. Um, I know that you've built your, I just want to make sure the audience knows we you built your presentation based on questions that we collected in advance from the Alport community through our Facebook support group. So mm -hmm. this is really focused on um, questions from the Alport community. So yeah. without further ado, I'll let you get into that. And then afterwards, uh, we'll have more discussion with more questions uh, that came from the community. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for having me here. Um, my name is Rebecca Goodrich. I'm a registered dietitian, and let's get started. So let's look at the next slide. Okay, so a little background of me. Um, Lisa mentioned a couple things. Um, I am a registered dietitian. My practice is called Rad Nutrition. Um, I do specialize in chronic kidney disease along with other autoimmune conditions. Um, and I am the lead dietitian ambassador for UCLA Core Kidney Program with Dr. Rostogi. So let's say at, you know, at some point, right, you were diagnosed with Alport syndrome and you may have thought, um, now what, right? So I have this diagnosis, so what do I do next? And so maybe your first step would be, who do I speak to? Um, what should my diet be? What should I be eating? And that's a really common question. The question of what do I eat? So I wanna help kind of navigate through that, what to do, things to kind of focus on. So once your diagnosis has been confirmed, please consider speaking to a registered dietitian who specializes in kidney disease. And you may be asking yourself, well, what could differentiate somebody um, who specializes versus who doesn't specialize in it? And so that's why you wanna interview the dietitian, right? So you wanna ask specific questions such as what their experiences are. Have they worked alongside with a nephrologist? Have they worked in a dialysis unit? Um, and so dialysis units you know, is a, is a great way for dietitians to get experience with kidney disease. And so these are some of the things that you want to ask for. Um, you want to look at some past experiences and really, really important. You want to avoid unnecessary restrictions, you know? And so when we think of restrictions, we think of the renal diet because the renal diet, you avoid a lot of things, right? So we know we have to focus a lot on potassium. Um, we focus a lot on phosphorus, on sodium. And so it's really important to know that not everybody needs to be on a renal diet. And so this is some, something um, very important to speak with uh, to your registered dietitian. And I also like to look more on what you can have rather than what you can't have. And so part of this, knowing that, you know, with kidney disease, there's a lot of nutrients that we need to pay very close attention to. And so because of that, I want to make sure that you're still having a healthy and good relationship with food. So we still want to make it fun and tasty. So I want you to focus more on what you can have rather than what you can't have. Um, definitely have a plan in place with your nephrologist. So talking about transplant lists, possible donors, understanding important labs to look at, and medication adjustments as needed. So anytime you start modifying or switching up your diet, you may see a shift in certain uh, labs, you may see a, a shift in your blood pressure. And so that's why it's really important that you talk to your nephrologist about this, and both your nephrologist and your dietitian are on the same page, because things can change and you wanna work with those changes. 
And you definitely want to sustain a healthy lifestyle, right? So just with any kind of condition, whether or not you, you know, you have a diagnosis or not, it's really important overall for, for your overall health to maintain a healthy lifestyle. And that will include nutrition, movement or exercise, keeping good hydration status, and definitely managing uh, stress because that's a, that's a big one. Uh, next slide, please. So another really big question that I get is potassium, and we're going to spend some time on that. Um, but potassium in food labels, let's kind of understand the whys behind that. Why do I need to focus on a low potassium diet and things like that? So first and foremost, let's kind of look at what a high potassium food looks like. So a high potassium food is when the amount of potassium per serving in a food product has greater than 200 to 250 milligrams, right? And that's per serving or 20% or more of the daily value. And we'll look at this in, in the next slide in just a moment, but it's important to know that that number 200 and 250 milligrams, that's what's considered a high potassium food. So the next question is, well, when do I need to restrict my potassium intake? So remember, everybody's at a different stage in their kidney disease, and that's why it's important to look specifically at your labs, talking to your nephrologist, your dietitian, so that you know what's best for you. So you really, you really restrict potassium when your, lab, when your lab value of potassium exceeds in that higher range, right? Now, some other doctors or, um, or dietitians may suggest you kind of pull back once your labs start trending upward into a high potassium range. But all in all, if your potassium level is between 3.5, 5.0, so let's say your levels are at a four or 4.2, there's no need to restrict potassium. And it's really important that you do have that conversation with your physician and dietitian. Um, something really important to look at is your estimated glomerular filtration rate or the EGFR does not predict whether or not you need to restrict. And you wanna make changes as necessary according to your potassium levels. So that's why you wanna pay close attention to your labs and working with your team so that you know what's right for you. And it's also important to note that medications can also limit potassium excretion. And when there is a limit in that excretion because of the kidney disease, that's what induces hyperkalemia or high potassium levels. And so some medications, including angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, which are commonly prescribed medications, also potassium sparing diuretics and NSAIDs like Advil, which are considered nephrotoxic. So certain medications can induce hyperkalemia. And so that's something to just kind of remember if you're, you know, you're doing everything, why are my potassium levels um, high, just kind of keep note of that. Also, um, medications can possibly induce that. And also medications such as cyclosporine and tacrolimus, um, these medications have also been shown to induce hyperkalemia. Next slide, please. So let's look at the food label, right? So let's kind of bring this into action. So when you look at this nutrition facts label, remember that a high potassium food is when a potassium level is greater than 200 to 250 milligrams per serving. So when we look at this nutrition facts label, let's kind of jump down to where it says potassium. And you see how it says 141 milligrams and then next to that says 4%. So the 4%, that's the daily value percentage. And so when we look at the serving size, it says two cakes. And so two cakes gives you 141 milligrams or 4% of that daily value. Now that's considered a low potassium food, right? Because it, it's less than that 200 and 250, it's less than 20% of daily value, but here's the kicker. So let's say you have four cakes, right? What happens next? We got to double up that potassium because that's what you've consumed. You've, you've, double up, you've doubled up the serving size. And so now we see that we're at 282 milligrams of potassium and aha, that's considered a higher potassium food. So that's just kind of a little example of, of high potassium and reading labels. Uh, next slide, please. So some final thoughts, um, this is really important that there is not one diet that will fit everyone's needs. So nutrition recommendations, labs, lifestyle habits, and other medical conditions play a huge role into your medical nutrition therapy, your prescription, and things like that. So everyone has 
a different prescription. Everyone has different recommendations. And it's also important to stay in touch with your community. So doing events like these, participating in events um, where you're talking about your diagnosis, your condition, can really help you understand your condition just a bit better. You learn what's kind of going out there. You're staying updated on research, which is really important because we know research is always changing, um, especially with the nutrition part. Um, so that research is constantly changing. And continue to have a good rapport with your, nephro with your nephrologist. So making sure that you know, you don't want to dread seeing your nephrologist, right? You want to get, you know, excited and looking forward to it. And, and you want to learn more about yourself. And, you know, how do I, how do I control my condition? How do I, um, how do I understand my condition better? What can I possibly do to really help myself and my body? And so something good to kind of you know, a, a positive way to kind of take that approach is also thinking to yourself, okay, you know, the more I see my nephrologist, right, the more I see my dietitian, the more data I'm going to receive through labs, through procedures and tests. And so the more data, the better, because then you get to know just a little bit more about yourself, which is a, which is a win-win for sure. Um, and create your own interdisciplinary team or the, or IDT and what that looks like. So you have your nephrologist, you got your dietitian, you got your therapist, which is very important whenever you have any kind of condition, because they can really help you during that time. Um, your social worker um, and any other, you know, extra, you know, support system that you feel would be very uh, beneficial for you. And last but not least, you've got this. Okay, you, you totally have this. Um, I know because, you know, personally, I have an autoimmune condition and I, and I know how stressful it can be at times. And so just remember that everyone has their own journey and it's very separate from each other, but stay positive. Okay. Because we have resources and you guys are on a really great path. So I just, I really wanted to, um, to say that to you all. Thank you again so much for, for having me. And uh, I hope this was helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Well, now we're going to move right into questions. Um, thanks for really um, putting together that presentation based on questions from patients. Really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and, and I really appreciate what you're saying about getting your team together. And mm -hmm. I, I personally understand from my own patient journey and with my son that that's been really important. Um, and I will say that that getting that data was really great um, and having your labs, because for example, then when I worked with you directly to have you uh, help my son uh, connect before when he went off to college, he was having so many problems with potassium and you were helping him directly with building a, a sort of a diet plan, a nutrition plan at college, living yeah. in the dorms and not having access to his own food. Somebody else is taking care of that through, through dorm food. Mm -hmm. um, that was so helpful. And, and I know that was all based on his lab. So you could individually work with him about what mm -hmm. was going on in his own body. So mm -hmm. that was something that I didn't realize in working with a renal nutritionist like yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I found, we found that so helpful a, as a family. And it helped us also understand about cooking our own meals, how mm -hmm. we could help at home. Uh, so personally, I understand what you're talking about. I'm glad you're, you're sharing those tips with others. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get into some other questions, Rebecca, that, that have come in through the uh, Alport community, we, we advance, we ask these questions in advance we, uh, in our Facebook support group. And here are, are some questions that have come in. Plant-based diets <laughs> for chronic kidney disease. In recent years, that's become a really big thing. Some nephrologists we find are talking to patients about it. Um, and it seems to be routinely suggested for those in chronic kidney stages, uh, you know, four and five. But are there also benefits, you know, all along our journey? Uh, can you give us a little bit of your perspective on plant-based diets for chronic kidney disease patients, including Alport syndrome? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's a really great question. Um, and there's there's a lot there's a lot with that the difference between plant based and animal based protein. Um, so first and foremost, I like to kind of separate the two. Okay, so there's there's what we called the we call the standard. Uh, American diet, which is also known as the SAD diet. And the SAD diet is considered to be very high in animal protein. It's high in sugar. It's high in saturated fat or unhealthy fats. While it's low in fiber, it's low in vegetables, plants, whole grains, seeds, and nuts. And so what we do know about the standardized American diet is that it leads to things like diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, heart disease, metabolic syndrome, and other conditions. Um, what we do know about 
plant-based diets and plant-based diets is kind of like this sort of like an umbrella term. So it, it encompasses many other diets. So within the plant-based diet, um, there's vegan, there's vegetarian, there's Mediterranean diet, um, there's lacto-ovo vegetarian. So it's not plant-based diet does not mean vegan. Vegan can be under plant-based, but so can other diets be under plant-based. And so that's just kind of the difference between the two. Now, when we talk about plant-based diets and kidney disease, there is a lot of great research showing how promising a plant-based diet is on kidney disease to number one, retain um, kidney function. So it helps, um, it helps decrease the acceleration or progression of kidney disease. So we know that, that's the first thing. The second thing that we know is it decreases the production of uremia or uremic toxins. And uremic toxins are, these guys are really um, heavily involved in kidney disease. And so usually when we consume a high animal protein diet, an animal could could be chicken, turkey, eggs, red meat. Um, it can also include fish in there because it's animal protein. Um, but I like to say fish is kind of an exception between the other animal proteins. So these uremic toxins are actually produced from these animal sources. And what we know with uremia is it causes nausea, vomiting, anorexia. Um, we know that it progresses kidney disease. And we also know that consuming a high animal protein diet favors metabolic acidosis. And so we never want to be in an acidic state with kidney disease because that can further the progression of kidney failure. And it can also lower albumin levels, which we don't want because albumin is not so much of a protein marker, but more of an inflammatory marker. So we know that consuming a, a diet that's heavy in animal protein can lead to these other conditions, which we, which we don't want. We want to avoid that. And the other thing is something very common with kidney disease is proteinuria. So we see protein in the urine. And so what the studies has, has shown us is that the reduction of proteinuria, better control of blood pressure, um, uh, preventing heart disease, we know that all these types of conditions can be really controlled through a plant-based diet. And, and we do know that heart disease is actually a comorbidity of kidney disease. So that's something that we also wanna focus on too, which is why it's so beneficial to consume a plant-based diet. So we may think to ourselves, well then what's a plant-based diet? What, what is it? So it can really be a lot of things as, as we kind of talked about, um, the prevention of, of certain animal uh, foods, but it doesn't mean none. It just means limiting your intake. So it's really focusing on an increase in plants, meaning vegetables, increasing fruit intake, increasing nuts. So things like cashews, walnuts, which walnuts are so good for your heart. Um, so that's, that's very beneficial. Um, uh, we said nuts, seeds, uh, whole grains are really important. And the thing about these foods is that they have anti-inflammatory components. So we know that kidney disease can also produce an inflammatory state, any kind of disease or anything kind of you know, acting up in our, in our bodies can, can result in inflammation. And so foods have antioxidants in them, which have been shown to help fight against oxidative stress, um, which promotes inflammation. So that's why consuming a plant-based diet is extremely beneficial. <laughs> so in a, in a nutshell. Well, I appreciate that. That's a lot of information to unpack, yeah. <laughs> but very, very helpful. And something that was hit home yesterday um, mm -hmm. And something maybe that not is talked enough about maybe in our own community is heart health associated with chronic kidney disease. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate you mentioning that as well. It's something mm -hmm. I, I think we need to explore more, yeah. um, but an educate to maybe provide more resources and education about that. Um, but I appreciate understanding that a plant-based diet is, is not only better for your kidneys, but also um, oh. your heart. Mm -hmm. which is really important. Um, when you talked about fish being one of those sort of in-between things, can yeah. you say more about what are there specific types of fish that are yeah. helpful or not helpful? Or can you speak a little bit about that as a source of uh, protein? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about fish, I, I'm really focusing in on the fish that I would like for you to have. So mostly um, wild caught fatty fish. So things like salmon, halibut, mackerel, cod, um, definitely avoiding fish that are 
that are bigger, like swordfish, uh, you definitely want to avoid those types of fish because you think of the food chain, they consume smaller fishes. And so whatever they're consuming, you're basically consuming. So, um, it's better to consume uh, fatty fish. And the other, the other reason why I make a little bit more of an exception with fish is because of their omega-3 content. So they have omega-3 fatty acids, which are essential fatty acids, meaning that our bodies do not produce omega-3s. And omega-3s have been shown to be very beneficial for heart health as well. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's very beneficial for, for heart health and it can also be anti-inflammatory. So I highly recommend that. And you, you can get um, omega-3 sources from other foods as well. So not just fish, you can also get it from flaxseed oil. There's a little bit in, in, in uh, walnuts. So, you know, it, it doesn't have to just be fish, but I, I do make a little bit more of an exception with fatty fish because of, because it's, it's still pretty nutritious for us. So, yeah. Excellent. And I, and I think um, when you were talking about a plant-based diet, I think we want to also address for the parents out there, the parents yeah. who are, you know, make it, preparing the meals at home for their children who are growing up with chronic kidney disease, growing up with Alport syndrome. Um, can you talk to us about how you see that of um, like meeting their protein needs? Uh, is that okay through a plant-based diet? Yeah. Um, would you recommend that at any age or uh, just speaking to us about the, the protein needs of, of children that are growing for those of us, you know, raising kids? Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, what we do know about plant-based protein is that it actually can have a similar profile to animal-based protein. And so what I mean by that is if we kind of take a couple steps back, so the building, so protein, protein is not just protein, right? There's building blocks of protein that creates protein. And those building blocks are called amino acids. And so we have nine essential amino acids, meaning our bodies do not make these amino acids. So we need to get it from our diet. And that's why, that's why we love animal protein because it's boom, there's no thinking involved. We got all the essential amino acids with plant-based proteins. You have to think a little bit. So there are, you know, there are ways to still meet your protein needs and to still, and to still get those essential amino acids from plant-based proteins. So for instance, we know beans and rice is a complete protein, meaning you're going to get all of your essential amino acids. We also know that quinoa has essential amino acids. We also know that certain foods are missing some amino acids while other foods meet those amino acids. So when you put them together, you have a full, you have a full complete protein. And here's the thing though, you don't need to consume these foods at the same time. So if you, let's say you have, you know, tofu salad and some quinoa on there, and let's say, you know, or not quinoa, let's say we're using brown rice, that way we're missing some amino acids. And then later on in the day, you um, add some almonds at, in your snack, you're able to meet all the essential amino acids. So it, it's not like you have to sit down and have all the amino acids in one sitting. You can have it throughout the day. And yes, you can still meet your protein and, and amino acid profile without having animal foods, having animal protein. What about for those, you know, for the, our kids that were raised out there who may be not I'm um, going to have a quinoa salad for lunch. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> so. yeah, no I, I definitely get that because not everybody likes it, you know? And so that's why, you know, as personally for me and, and every dietitian is different, but personally, when I'm working with patients that, you know, maybe it's a little bit harder for them to adopt a plant-based diet, it really depends on, on where we're starting, right? So if you know that you have a picky eater, it's gonna be harder to do something like this. That's where it gets really individualized and we have to kind of figure out the tools of what works for them and what doesn't work for them and how can we meet in the middle? So, you know, there, there's no, okay, you're never gonna have chicken ever or you're not gonna have turkey. It's about finding that happy medium really. So keeping everything in balance. Um, but what I do like to suggest is trying to get in as much plants as possible because we know how protective they are for the kidneys. So really emphasizing that. You know, this just raised me something, a question that I, that I hadn't thought of before. Yeah. Um, but, and it's something that I don't know about your specific expertise, which is nutrition. So mm -hmm. 
um, when you're certified, are you certified then to work with all ages or is there a difference between pediatric and adult renal dietitians? For our audience out there, um, mm -hmm. if they're trying to find support for their kids living with Alport syndrome and they're pediatric, do they have to find a specific pediatric nutrition specialist or can they work with? Yeah. Yeah. So when, when we become, so, and I'm speaking, I'm speaking on behalf of all the other dietitians. So when we become uh, registered dietitians through the Academy um, and, you know, we pass our, our board exam, you know, we're, we are able to work with all different ages, right? We are, we're, we're able to do that. Um, but, you know, it's still important to know that there are other dietitians that have that specialty. And it's kind of the same with kidney disease. So when you pass your RD exam, dietitians can see anybody with any kind of condition. And it's really what they're comfortable doing. Um, but it's almost kind of like an honor system where if you know that you're not specialized in pediatrics, because that is so specialized, um, then you should be seeking out somebody who is specialized in pediatrics. And that goes for the same with kidney disease, with diabetes, with heart disease. You want to work with somebody who has that experience. So interviewing them and, you know, making sure that this is a good fit for you. But that, that's, a, that's a great question. Yeah. Okay. Very mm -hmm. helpful to know. Yeah. Uh, let's yeah. move into something that I know so many people uh, ask questions about. I know my own family, we have struggled with this, um, is we talk about hyperkalemia, which means that you have, you know, a blood that you, you have a lot of potassium in your blood, right? High potassium. And um, that, that can be exacerbated by being on the standard of care for Alport syndrome, which is an ACE or an ARB medication like lisinopril or losartan. Mm -hmm. um, but also there are those of us like my son who, who never could tolerate those and his potassium growing up, you know, through his high school years, Mm -hmm. It was just such a challenge and he wasn't even on that medication, um, but it was just the chronic kidney disease that was, re that was really creating this uh, hyperkalemia, which can be really dangerous. And of course we get concerned about that. We sort of get panicked by our doctors. They're telling us, Hey, that's not in check. Um, you know, that that's something that you could be hospitalized for. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it becomes very serious because actually it can, it can cause it can cause stress on the heart and potential heart attack at, at any age if your potassium is, is out of control. So mm -hmm. it's something in our community that's really important. And we had a lot of people ask questions about that. So um, the first question is, if a potassium restricted diet is not effective mm -hmm. at management of potassium levels, um, what other options can be explored? Um, yeah. So uh, that, that's one question. And I think we talked a little bit about that in the treatment panel yesterday. Of there, there are different medications for it. Yep. Um, and you did talk about this in the nutrition panel, looking at the nutrition panel. Mm -hmm. But um, do you want to talk about a little bit about different stages of chronic kidney disease and potassium and um, maybe even different foods that we yeah. should be focused on? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, that's a really great question. And that is something that I, I really say on top of with my patients who have hyperkalemia. Uh, so yeah, no, that, that, that really is a big one. Um, so when there's a history of hyperkalemia, it's almost like this alert of, okay, you're, you're predisposed to getting high potassium levels. So we really have to stay on top of that. Um, so if the low potassium diet is not working and you're doing everything you can do, um, there are certain things you can do. So I, I like to really encourage my patients to be an investigator, look at the food labels, look for the word potassium, because if you see potassium, then, you know, you know, you want to stay away from that. And so things like potassium chloride is a salt substitute. And the issue with that is that these additives are highly absorbable. Um, it's, it's kind of the same with phos with phosphates, with phosphorus, you know, you want to be cautious of phosphorus in the blood. You don't want to have a build up that. So um, paying attention to these additives in the foods are going to be really crucial with helping with the, with the hyperkalemia. Um, let's say you're doing your, you know, you're very diligent on being that investigator, looking at those additives. And if that's still not working, you know, also make sure that, you know, your, your physician is aware and, you know, your physician, like you were saying, Lisa, um, they were talking about some medications. So there are potassium binders that patients can take to help lower their potassium levels. There's water pills. Um, and, you know, definitely just making sure that, 
um, you know, your, your nephrologist knows that you're having a hard time with, you know, with re you're, you're retaining too much of the potassium. So that's something that could be helpful. And then definitely making sure that you're staying away from herbal supplements um, and different remedies and even supplements, because some of these additives can be hiding in there and we don't even know it. So if you're consuming a product and even if it's a pill or it's a medication or, you know, it's, it's a bag of chips of something, right? And not potato chips, <laughs> but maybe they're tortilla chips and they use potassium chloride in there or some, some other additive, then that's something to be cautious of because that's kind of that, that hidden way of, of increasing uh, potassium. And then as far as the food sources go, so I like to, I call it the O's. <laughs> so the foods that are high in potassium have the O's in them. So things like potatoes, mangoes, avocados, tomatoes. Um, so that's kind of a little trick to remember your high potassium foods. We're also going to have miscellaneous fruits and vegetables there as well that we want to stay away from. But for the bulk and the majority that usually what I tend to see my patients um, having too much of are really going to be those O's. Um, we know that oranges can also be problematic. We also know that spinach can be problematic. Um, and interestingly enough, cooked spinach has a lot of a higher potassium content than raw spinach. So something to be cautious of. Certain milks as well can also be high in potassium. Um, and we know that with potatoes, if you double boil potatoes, that's a little trick to kind of, you know, take out that, that added uh, potassium content. Um, but yeah, there, there are different ways. Um, but generally speaking, from a nutrition standpoint, if it really is, you know, problematic, you know, it's important that we really be an investigator and, and see where the hidden potassium is coming from. Yeah, yeah that, that's very helpful. And for us, for my own son, it was milk. That was the issue. Yeah, Once I we changed I over, that. Yeah. <laughs> that, that helped a lot because he was just drinking so much milk his whole life. I remember that. <laughs> it was his main staple for hydration. Yeah. Um, yes. And once we changed that, that was helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, you're right. Everybody's different. And that's why it's so helpful to work directly uh, mm -hmm. with a renal dietitian. Um, so there are some specific questions here um, about things like um, actual meat versus fake meat meat products. Somebody asked that question. I think it's a good one because those seem to be popular and there's a lot of messaging about, oh, this is so much healthier, uh, the miracle meat products or whatever they may be. Yeah, um, yeah. What is your, what is your perspective on that for patients? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. So, um, we talk about meat versus, um, fake meat. Uh, so the way that I look at it is, you know, when we look at, um, fake meat. So for instance, like beyond meat, you know, things like that, these foods tend to be pumped with a lot of additives. So we're talking about that potassium chloride, we're talking about, um, you know, phosphates. Um, and, you know, we're talking about a lot of sodium. Um, it's just really a high ultra processed type of food versus meat, where there really isn't as many additives. It's just kind of what it is. It's meat, it's, it's animal protein. So you know, from my own expertise, what I would recommend my patient doing is to actually have the meat instead of the alternative meat, because the alternative meat has all of the other stuff in there. Um, so that's, you know, that's really going to be the biggest difference between the two. Yeah, that makes sense. That's helpful. Yeah. Um, one thing that um, I know you and I discussed a little bit is this, um, there's a change that, go, that goes on that's pretty drastic along the path of, of chronic kidney disease, changes to nutrition recommendations over disease progression, yes. um, right? So uh, we've got all these things we're looking out for in stages one and two and sort of trying to be mindful. Mm -hmm. And then and then once you get to end stage renal disease, we were not prepared in our family that all of a sudden they were saying, you know, salt tablets and you know mm -hmm. this sort of thing. And then all mm -hmm. of a sudden he's on dialysis and they're saying, now eat meat. And he said, mm -hmm. I, you know, my son was like, I haven't had, red meat in four years, but now you yeah. want me to eat meat. Uh, so there are all these yeah. big shifts that happen uh, that we were not prepared and that like we hadn't really talked about that so much. Um, can you sort of walk us through a little bit about that sort of progression so that people are aware and just mindful yeah. um, as disease progresses that, that things can change with nutritional recommendations? 
Absolutely, absolutely. So we have clinical guidelines um, called Kadoki, and Kadoki has really set these guidelines for nutrition in those with uh, kidney disease. And you know, basically, what happens is as kidney disease progresses, your protein intake also changes, and so protein changes really occur at kidney disease stage three. Um, However, the amount of protein can be different for somebody with diabetes because protein intake for diabetes, um, for diabetic patients who also have kidney disease is a little bit higher. Um, and so that will really fluctuate. It really depends on the patient, their condition, their history, everything like that. So it's very individualized, but as kidney disease starts progressing, protein changes can also change as well. Um, and so what we do know about um, the progression of kidney disease and changes in, in the diet is once you hit end stage renal disease or stage five, and once you're on dialysis, what happens is um, dialysis is you know, it, it's, it's, it's a treatment. It's a life-saving treatment. We know that it's, it's so crucial. It's so important. Um, however, what we do know about dialysis and nutrition is that when a patient is receiving dialysis, their, you know, their blood is getting cleaned out of course. And so what else is coming out are essential nutrients. So you lose vitamins, you lose protein, and that's actually going to be the biggest marker. So protein tends to be lost. And so um, a common, a common, I guess, side effect from dialysis that I have seen in the past is malnutrition. And I've seen protein energy wasting. Um, and so that's why, you know, when you are in stage, you know, three or four, and then you're on dialysis, your protein needs are really going to shift from, you know, 0 0.60 to all of a sudden you're up to 1.25 or, you know, I've, I've had some patients where they need even 1.5 grams and this is grams per your weight per day. And so um, that number overall just really shifts. Um, and again, it depends on somebody's history. So I can't give, you know, general guidelines right now because everyone's different. Um, but that protein intake does change because on dialysis, um, you are losing those essential nutrients. Now, as far as meat goes, just because you're on dialysis, that still doesn't mean that you should be loading yourself up with red meat and all this chicken and, you know, things like that, because remember that a high intake of animal protein can also produce uremic toxins. And those uremic to toxins examples are precrestal and um, indoxal sulfate. And so these uremic toxins have also shown to cause bacterial translocation in the gut, which we know the gut is really tied to all of this as well. So common symptoms that you might see while on dialysis are things like diarrhea. So you start seeing changes like that also in your digestive tract. And so that's also another reason why you want to focus on plant-based proteins because they're very helpful. Um, beans are great, tofu, and those are some examples of plant of, of plant protein. So it's not so much of never having animal protein ever again. It's just trying to create that balance. So let's have more of plants and let's have a little less of animal protein. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Because oh, we'll, we'll run out of time so quickly. Oh. I want to ask a question about. Yeah. Um, hydration really quickly. And I yes. also want to put, I think your last slide didn't load correctly. So we want to be able to, um, we want to be able to, uh, give your, your website to folks. Um, sure. so just in case, yeah. um, yeah. so, but before that, I just want to ask you about hydration, um, because yeah. it was a question that people had hydration tips in general, mm -hmm. um, just overall for chronic kidney disease patients, including yeah. syndrome, and also one particular on, um, any methods for those on hemodialysis. Yeah. Um, and who have severe water restrictions. Yeah. Anything you want to mention about um, hydration? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're on dialysis, most likely you're going to have some fluid restrictions unless you have, you know, a little bit of kidney functioning and you're urinating. But overall, um, with fluid restrictions, there are ways to still help with hydration. So a couple of tips and tricks. So when you're drinking water, make sure that you're using a small glass and not a big glass. You know, that way you don't feel the need to finish the glass and just taking smaller sips and not big gulps. So that's going to be a big thing. Number two, and I know for a lot of us, this may not sound surprising, but limiting your sodium intake because wherever salt goes, water follows. And so when you start consuming high salty foods, guess what? 
thirst mechanism turns on, you get thirsty and you want to drink. So really um, decreasing your intake of that. Um, maybe keeping a supply of hard candies. So things like lemon drops, those are some examples I tell my patients in dialysis um, because it helps produce saliva. And so that, that can also be very helpful too. Um, just make sure that they're sugar-free because sometimes high sugar foods can also um, trigger a thirst mechanism. So too much sugar makes you thirsty as well. So just kind of being mindful of that. Um, and so let's say your fluid restrictions are about one liter or a thousand milliliters per day, which is pretty typical, a thousand to 1200. Um, you know, that, that would be, you know, I guess that would be four glasses per day. So if you, you know, if you really divide the amount throughout the day, that can also help you. So if you do half a cup in the morning and then half a cup at snack, right? So just kind of dividing it up can help you as well to not overdo it. Yeah. That's very, very helpful. We have just, just um, a minute left. Yeah. So um, uh, before we go on and, uh, you know, we have our next session this afternoon. Yeah. Um, I, I want to make sure we uh, give your website. Um, is, that, okay. is that the best way to, to show people who you are and, and if they have yeah. questions or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so my, my website is radnutrition.health. So it's not .com, it's .health. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm located in Los Angeles. My, my practice is in Los Angeles and I'm also located in Florida. Um, and yeah, just, just kind of my, I guess my own quick last thoughts too. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think just kind of the bulk of everything when you're working with your dietitian, make sure that you feel comfortable. You feel like you can trust your dietitian and same goes with your physician. Just make sure that you feel you have that support. That's so, so, so important. And, um, you know, just remember too, that everybody, you know, everyone's nutrition is individualized. Not everybody's the same. So please take that into consideration too. So not one diet is for everybody. That, that does make sense. Um, it really does make sense. And is there a way um, for folks to find a, a best way to find a renal dietitian? Yeah. Um, can can yeah. you guide, guide us on that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you're in the country, so there's National um, Kidney Foundation, and they have a lot of different dietitians according to where you live in your state. So that's a way to to look up um, a dietitian. You can also look on the Academy of Nutrition's West website. So Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, um, that could be another way. And just also, you know, you can you can use Google and just look, you know, for a dietitian, dietitian specializing in kidney disease, just make sure you're looking for a dietitian and not a nutritionist. There's a little bit of a difference there. So look for the RD next to the name. Just make sure they have that RD credential. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Of and, and of course, we're gonna, I'm going to put that information in writing in our announcements and in our follow-up messaging for patients. You've been so lovely and helpful and knowledgeable. Thank you so much for volunteering your time today uh, to help educate us. I yes, really appreciate so it much, so much. Uh, yes, and thank, thank you, you so much, everybody, for having me.